Thank you all for having me. Um, I'd like the opportunity to speak to you today about two conotruncal defects, truncus arteriosus and pulmonary atresia with ventricular septal defect. So I'll start first with truncus arteriosus, which is also called persistent truncus arteriosus, common arterial trunk. Um, this is a conotruncal defect in which there is failure of septation of the conotruncus. Um, so that gives rise to one singular um, artery um, from the base of the heart that um, includes the systemic artery, the aorta, the pulmonary artery, and the coronary arteries. There's only one semilunar valve, which we call the truncal valve, um, and there's almost always a ventricular septum, uh, septal defect. So the truncal valve in this great artery is, uh, sits over both of the ventricles. Um, it's most commonly a tricuspid valve, although there is a higher prevalence of bicuspid or quadricuspid valves um, as compared to normal uh, semilunar valves. Um, they are more often dysplastic. There could be nodules. Um, they're usually dysplastic, thickened, um, and uh, have more degree of uh, um, dysfunction than normal semilunar valves, um, most, most often regurgitant uh, than stenotic. So there's a, a strong association between truncus and 22Q11 uh, microdeletion, genotypically or the George syndrome uh, phenotypically, with as much as 30% of truncus having 22Q11 abnormality. Arch abnormalities are also more common in about 15% of these patients, uh, as well as aberrant subclavian artery and right-sided aortic arch, all of which um, affects the surgical approach of these patients. As uh, uh, you can see, as much as 10 to 20% of atrial septal defect as well, uh, and coronary anomalies are also very frequent. With truncus and, and as with other clonotruncal abnormalities, there is an increased incidence in the setting of maternal diabetes of conferring um, at least 10% fold increased risk. So there are multiple classifications for truncus, and I don't think that these classifications are really important to commit to memory, um, but they do come up as, as these were the way that they were described um, you know, uh, with the initial repair. Um, so it's important just to know the aspect of them. Um, the Colette Edwards is the older classification, and um, that classification is basically based on the location of the pulmonary arteries. And then the Van Prague classification is um, based on the degree of the aortical pulmonary septation. Um, I think the most important thing to remember is that type 1 truncus is the most common, um, and which consists of a single orifice of the main pulmonary artery, which gives off a short segment and then bifurcates into the right and left pulmonary artery. Um, and then type two uh, is the second most common, which uh, two separate orifices of the right and left pulmonary arteries in close relationship with each other. Um, and then um, type four um, is, no, uh, is no longer um, kind of described in this classification as um, they have been reclassified as pulmonary atresia with ventricular septal defect, which I'll talk about in a couple minutes. I think the only important thing uh, with the Van Prog classification to note is that uh, the type 4 Van Prog um, is associated with arch underdevelopment, which is more commonly linked with 20Q11. So practically, I think um, the easiest thing to remember about trunk classification is to determine whether or not it's aortic dominant or uh, pulmonary dominant. So the aortic dominant is uh, characterized by adjacent or nearly adjacent origins of the pulmonary arteries here. Um, and that is the most common type of truncus. And then the pulmonary dominant um, is associated with arch abnormalities, interrupted aortic arch, coarctation, arch hyperplasia. Um, and this, uh, even though it's the more rare form of truncus, is associated with increased surgical risk and worsened outcomes. So for most uh, adult patients that are still alive have been repaired. Um, since the first repair of the truncus in the 1960s, um, there's a lot of uh, surgical advancement uh, of this management. Nowadays, this, the typical approach is to, um, to repair these patients within the first week of life. Um, and this involves um, basically um, detaching the uh, truncal root um, detaching the pulmonary artery from the aorta, closing the VSD, and then reattaching the aorta to the truncal root, 
and then placement of uh, a conduit from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery. And up until the 1980s, um, it was not uncommon to have these patients repaired later um, than six months of age, and, but we know now that that's uh, associated with increased risk of pulmonary arterial hypertension. The truncal valve or arch abnormalities um, may also need to be addressed, and um, the presence of those uh, confers increased risk for, for surgical um, mortality as well. So despite the advancements of um, the surgical approach, these patients often have late-term complications, uh, the most common being dysfunction of the pulmonary artery, uh, the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery conduit. As you can imagine, these patients uh, were, uh, these conduits were placed very, very young in life, and over time, due to the growth of the patient and no growth of the, the conduit, these become stenotic, calcified, um, there may be luminous stenosis. Um, if a conduit with a monocus is placed, uh, there could be some degrees of uh, regurgitation, uh, all of which may need to be addressed as adults or young adults uh, timely um, to prevent right ventricular dysfunction. Um, you may also see that uh, the truncal valve may have varying degrees of regurgitation or stenosis, which will need to be addressed. There is aortic dilation, which is common in conotruncal um, defects, um, although we, we, we think that the risk of aortic um, complication is lower in these patients compared to aortopathies or bicuspid valves, and so the threshold to prophylactically replace um, uh, these enlarged aortas um, are not the same. They're actually higher. So that was a quick review on truncus, and then moving on to pulmonary atresia with uh, intact ventricular septum. So as suggested by the name, um, pulmonary atresia with VSD consists of a pulmonary valve um, in the presence of a ventricular septal defect. This should be distinguished from a completely different congenital defect called pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum, which is completely separate and uh, confers a completely different approach to management. And in fact, pulmonary atresia with ventricular septum or PAVSD um, share some anatomic features with Tetralogy of Fellow, and um, in the past have also been categorized under the term of Tetralogy of Fellow with pulmonary atresia. But in this, uh, so in this case, um, the right the, the pulmonary valve is completely atretic. The right ventricular outflow tract ends in a blind pouch, and so there is obligate right to left shunting through the ventricular septal defect in the aorta. And then the pulmonary artery architecture is completely variable, um, ranging from the presence of a main pulmonary artery that's small and confluent right and left pulmonary arteries to very, very hypoplastic, maybe still confluent pulmonary arteries um, and with some aortopulmonary collaterals to virtually no um, formed pulmonary artery architecture and um, uh, presence of a lot of aortopulmonary collaterals. So a important associations to remember, again, is the maternal diabetes, as in all conotruncal defects. Um, and right-sided aortic arch is seen in about 25% uh, of these patients. And 22Q11 microdeletion, also very common and found in up to 40% in some studies. Most of these patients need surgical repair as as young infants. Um, on the very rare occasion, um, you may have seen a patient with uh, balanced kind of pulmonary collaterals that are just right so they're not so cyanotic and not so many so that they're not over circulating. And um, you know, these patients can remain unrepaired uh, as adults, but that is very, very rare. Um, the, the typical surgical approach is really completely a variable depending on the architecture of the pulmonary arteries. Um, so if you have confluent pulmonary arteries, um, branch PAs, um, then they can be connected to a right ventricle to uh, pulmonary artery conduit, which is almost always um, uh, a requirement. And then in the severe form where you really don't have any pulmonary artery architecture, um, these um, aortal pulmonary collaterals um, have to go through a, a phase called uh, univocalization in which um, the collaterals are detached from the aorta and then connected and then amassed into uh, one confluence on either side of the pulmonary um, 
for right and left pulmonaries, and then the confluence connected to the right ventricle to pulmonary artery conduit, and usually the VSD is closed as well. So as you can imagine from these surgeries, um, there's a high risk of um, dysfunction of the right ventricle, the pulmonary artery conduit, again, um, as in truncus as well. And then depending on the anatomy of the pulmonary arteries, you may have residual or recurrent branch pulmonary artery stenosis that may require transcatheter or surgical um, intervention throughout the patient's life. Very uh, often these patients may have some degree of residual uh, right ventricular pressure overload from branch PA stenosis um, and are at risk of uh, RV dysfunction. Um, LV dysfunction can occur as well, especially in the setting RV dysfunction. Um, the aortic dilation we've kind of briefly discussed um, with, uh, with chondrotrunkal de defects and arrhythmia is common as well. So I'll summarize and find some final thoughts and some commonalities of these chondrotrunkal defects. Um, typically, surgical management uh, are required uh, and then late repaired are associated with uh, development of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Uh, I would remember that there's a close association of 22Q11 uh, and the George with these chondrotrunkal defects, and that comes into play when you have young adult patients um, that are considering pregnancy or considering, or even male patients um, thinking about starting families. Um, and these patients uh, have lifelong risk of uh, RV to PA conduit obstructions, um, regurgitation, uh, and then t optimal timing of intervention for those conduit is uh, key to preserving the ventricular function. Thank you.